What if you could take your signature side dish and turn it into a six-figure side hustle? Today on the Rainmaker Family Show, we interviewed our guest, Meredith, who is literally living off of $50 a week to feed her family of four, barely making ends meet, to growing a multiple seven-figure catering business. And now she helps other entrepreneurs launch businesses as well. Today on the show, she's going to give you some mom hacks on how to meal prep well, as also give you some mindset shifts that you need to take action on today. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Rainmaker Family Show. Today, we have a sweet connection. We actually sat on a bus on a ride to a mastermind next to this individual. And we could just tell there was a wealth of knowledge that we wanted to bring on the show. And so today, I'll tell you a little bit about her in just a second. But today, I just want to welcome Meredith. Welcome, Meredith. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome. Now, Meredith has a very vast history of entrepreneurial journeys. But why we thought it would be awesome for you to listen to her today is because she really carries um, some superpowers that I believe can really help moms in business, help entrepreneurs who are going from startup to scaling to even, you know, the place you are now, Meredith, with some of your businesses, we're in more of an advisory role. We have more time freedom. That's really a lot of the reason people get into our world is they, they don't just want to build a business or build a job for themselves. They want to build a business, something that they have time freedom in. And so we'd love to dig into your journey a little bit and see what goal we can extract in the process and then hear a little bit about, you know, what you're pioneering now. So Meredith, I guess let's start by taking us back. You kind of talked about starting your business. You were um, six months pregnant, you know, and just starting your kitchen. Take us back to that moment. What led to that decision of, I guess, taking the step of faith into the entrepreneurial world? So ironically enough, that wasn't our first step. Uh, that, that was, I was 26 years old and that was our fifth business. Um, and we were recovering from a very expensive previous business lesson. I'll say it that way. Uh, and so, um, my husband was in Iraq. He was deployed as a civilian contractor after having gotten out of the military and having been deployed. And, uh, he was over there trying to make extra cash because of a rather expensive business experience. And uh, honestly, what led to the start of this particular company and our catering company, which is sort of our flagship, uh, was a fight. And uh, he was over there trying to make money to get us out of a, a rough financial situation. I was staying at home with our two boys at that time. And uh, every time he called me, I was cooking for someone. And he would say, like, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, so-and-so just had a baby. The church called someone sick, you know, the, all of these things that would happen. And uh, he was like, great. Who is paying for all of this? I said, well, I just, I enjoy it and I want to help. And, and they called. So, you know, it, it, that was kind of how it went. And, uh, and he was not thrilled <laughs> with that. So I, I actually was joking with a few friends that uh, said, you know, just, hey, I need to figure out a way to get paid for this. Or when he gets home, we're going to have real problems around this situation. And honestly, I was, a, so I'm a person of faith. I was sitting in church a couple of weeks later. And I always, when I'm in church, I, I have a page that I take notes on and then I have an open page because that tends to be over the years where I get ideas. And so I had this open page and I just had this thought, if I'm getting these phone calls all the time, it's because there's no one else doing this. So maybe there's an opportunity here. And so I called my husband and said, okay, I think I have an idea. Now, mind you, he's in Iraq still, said, I think I want to start, you know, this business where I can cook meals for people. And they can just come pick them up on their way home. So they get a home cooked meal, no more fast food lines, but in fast food time. Because our kids played sports, you know how busy the afternoons and evenings are. And, um, and who wants to feed their kids chicken nuggets and french fries every night of a week, right? So that was the initial concept. And he said, you know what? That sounds like a great idea. Why don't, why don't we see what it would take to make it happen? Uh, and I hung up on him the second the sentence got out of his mouth. Uh, because historically, I'm I'm the idea person, and he's like the no man, right? <laughs> and uh, and so um, I and literally, I hung up, and I called him back later. I said, "I'm sorry, I'm, I I hung up, but I didn't want you to change your mind." <laughs> and three weeks later, we started knocking bricks out of our garage, converted it into a commercial kitchen, and a catering company was born. So it was just, yeah, it it was one of those times where. I had been in banking for a little bit to try and just recover, you know, financially. 
And I am so not a desk job person. Having to sit somewhere from eight to five Monday through Friday is, it's, it's just not a good fit for me. So when this came up and I saw the opportunity to continue to be home with my kids, Literally, my youngest son that I was six months pregnant with, his playpen was in my kitchen in my garage until he was two years old. So he learned very early on that the world did not revolve around him because if I had to get food out, he had to come with me. You know, we there were a lot of things that we did in that time. Um, but at the same time, it gave me the flexibility to really start to operate on my own terms. Wow, that's absolutely incredible. And Meredith, I just want to like brag on you for a minute because not only, you know, you started this incredible catering company, but you've won like awards, multiple awards for how like incredible your company is and the food that you make and provide for people. So can you give us just like a little snapshot of like where that company is now, like as far as where you've been able to grow and the things you've been able to do? Because I, I think like we just heard the story about like starting with your son in his play pitch and play play what am I trying to say play play pen in the kitchen play pen I've got a little tongue (laughs) um, to where you are now because I want to I want people to like know like where you are now which I think is incredible yeah so today and it's been 17 years later um we're the largest catering company in central Texas uh we have about a three and a half acre property with 7,000 square feet of facilities uh we employ about 120 people and um, we specialize in events of 500 plus people. So we do a lot of work still with the military. That's kind of our primary uh, client base. And, you know, we've been able to develop a really amazing team. And honestly, the reason we do all of what we do today, let me just be completely honest here, has very little to do with me and a whole lot to do with them. Uh, we have had, we've been able to kind of just create a culture where a lot of our management team um, has been with us for over a decade. Wow. And so they really play a massive part in, you know, running the different facets uh, of the company and what we're able to offer. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 grown and expanded a lot over the years. And I, I won't lie. It didn't just great expand. There's been a lot of expand, contract, expand, contract. Uh, but uh, but that's where we are now. Wow. That's amazing. I feel like a lot of, you know, our listeners, they do, they start with the seed, the seed of an idea. And it's like, sometimes you have no idea where the seed could grow or grow into. And I'm sure back then in the kitchen, it was like, hey, I just want to bring in some side income. Like this is like some side hustle money. But now this has become your main thing. You know, it's spurred off other businesses that you guys have gone into. And it's so hard to even predict that. I mean, did you have a vision at the beginning that you would be you know, running this, you know, have 120 employees, that type of thing. No, I just didn't want to go back to work at a bank. Like that was my, that was the motivation. I I really, you know, while my husband was deployed at that time as a contractor, he was, that was back when government contractors that were deployed had uh, tax-free income up to a certain amount. So we were making much more than we would make when he came back stateside. And so we knew that we had a, a finite period of time that I either had to make something else work or I was going straight back to the desk. And so honestly, the pain of sitting behind a desk 40 hours a week was all the motivation I needed to figure out something. And it really didn't have to be a lot. So that that was kind of all it started with was, hey, if we could, you know, provide some food for an office lunch here or there and do these dinners for families and I can be home with the kids, then we're good. And And that was honestly as much of a vision as I had for it at that time. Mm. I'd love to know, Meredith, I mean, you talked about like, I just didn't want to, like your motivation was, I just don't want to have to go back to a desk job because that's not for me. But I'm curious, and maybe it's your thought process as well, but specifically your husband's, like how, like, why did he say yes again, you know, to the other business opportunity after you were trying to pull yourself out of a hole? And the reason why I'm asking this is because I think people give up too quickly. I think that they try something once and they, you know, we see that with our students, they launch one product and we do have this like method that they go through, but you know, any entrepreneurship and you said yourself, there's been lots of ups and downs as any journey. It's not a straight rate road to success. Um, and so I'm just curious, like back then, what kept you guys going after, you know, probably on paper, it looked like a failed business attempt. Yeah, well, no, it not just on paper. It was flat out until business attempt. So that literally, and and I'm, I talk about this when I teach, so I don't mind sharing it. 
that literally ended up in bankruptcy court. So we we were really starting over. And um, honestly, what made him say yes, first of all, is he knows me well enough to know that I'm going to find a way to do the things that I want to do. Um, and you know, there was going to be another iteration of it at some point. Um, but uh, what I think made him say yes as quickly as he did without us having to go through a lot of conversation and all of that is that he knew where I was in, in my personal journey at that point. He knew that I was in a good place, that I was being receptive to whatever was going to come next. I was in a very, I'll call it an open space of just being willing to talk with him about things, being willing to hear from God about things, talk with mentors that I you know, relied on. And I didn't know what that thing was going to be. I was just in a place where I was really open for whatever the next season of life was. And so I think because he knew that it was coming from that space and not a panic, I have to find the next thing space. It was very easy for him to, to see how that would work. That's awesome. How did you like, you know, you had young kids at the time. A lot of our listeners are like that where they have kids in some sort of journey and they want to build the business, but they also want to protect their, you know, the time with their family. Um, were there any systems you set up in the early days or even the part where you're like, I'm doing too much. I need to hire someone like mm -hmm. a moment like that, that, you know, you, you made sure you were protecting your time freedom in the journey. So this is something I'll, I'll say that I wish I would have done better. And, and I'll be very straightforward about that. In the first few years when the company was small, it was easy because it was just me and I had complete control over, do I take this job? Do I not? You know, but as the company grew and we did have some employees that were working with us, it became about, well, we have we have more expenses now. And during the first, I'm going to say during the first 10 years that the company grew, probably not the first two, I would say during the, the eight after that, um, I did it all wrong. I did it all wrong. I, I did not delegate well. I didn't. I hired great people, but I still had my hands in everything. And so I did miss a lot of things over the years. And, you know, my older boys and I have had, and they're both grown and out of the house now. And, you know, one of them has a daughter. And so um, we talk about that because the, the baseball games that I saw was because we were selling food at the concession stand. So I was working and I could peek around the corner and see when they were up to bat. But I wasn't present, you know. And so there were a lot of things that I missed during that time. And it wasn't until about 10 years in where I had a massive shift in the way that I approached the business. And there was there's a whole lot that went into that where I really was able to kind of switch that and go, you know what, this this can't keep going the way that it is because I can't keep going the way that I am. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that's that's where the dynamic of really protecting the family time came into place. Mm. What was that like yeah, massive shift? Yeah. If, you're, if you're willing to, like, what was the aha moment or was there? The moment you drew a line in the sand, like, I need to do something different. Uh, yeah, it was the moment that 10 years in, I was still working 80 hours a week and not consistently take the paycheck. And I, I was talking to my husband and I said, you know what? I'm done. I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to now, mind you, at this time, we, we were doing seven figures a year in sales and we had about 75 employees and uh, we had a restaurant open in conjunction with the catering company. And I was ready to walk away from all of it. And, and I'm not talking about sell it. Just walk away. I don't care if I make a penny. I can't do this anymore. And um, as you can imagine, that comes with some, some negative thought process. And, uh, and so I decided to go do something for, for myself. And uh, I signed up for a, a workshop uh, through the John Maxwell organization and said, hey, I'm going to just go take this workshop and try to get my head straight and maybe be about, around positive people for a week. and. I, I went to the workshop and we were in Orlando and it was all these great people. And I literally spent the entire week complaining about the life that I had built that I couldn't stand in a moment. And the last day there, I was in a workshop and one of the trainers was just taught. And it's, it's silly because it's stuff that I've heard a hundred times, but he was teaching on our thought processes and how we have the ability to change our mind. And it was like, Something just clicked where I went, wait a minute. I can change my mind. I can decide I want to feel differently about this. Like I can decide that I have control over my thoughts around it. 
um, I can decide that I want to look at it in a different way. And so from that point in time, it was like I took a different level of responsibility and ownership for what was going on. And the teaching was all around this thing of when you own something and you take responsibility for it, then you have the capacity or the ability to change it. And the analogy that I use with with my uh, people that I teach all the time is it's kind of like the difference between owning and renting a house. Because when you own the house, you can do whatever you want to. You can change paint colors, you can knock out walls, you can rip up carpet, do whatever you want. But when you're renting, you can't even put a picture on a wall if it's going to poke a hole, right? So if you're in that ownership mindset, then you can make whatever changes you want because you own it. And I, I came back with that and just started making simple adjustments and really diving into getting my own mental space well. And really, you know, I know people will, some people think the term personal development is like a little out there or whatever, but just really trying to learn more about how I could make sure that I kept myself in a good place mentally while I was trying to make these adjustments. Because when you already have a team, there's going to be some kickback to some of those things. Um, But honestly, we were able to take a 10-year-old company uh, that was not doing great and with less of my time and it became more profitable, we did we did 140% of revenue as a 10-year-old company by wow. making wow. that shift first and then you know, letting our team kind of dive in with that. So that that was the catalyst for it. And then it took, you know, took place over, I would say probably about a year after that. That's powerful. And I know um, as you have kind of built this company, you were just telling us before we start recording that you've kind of gotten to a place where you're in a more management role. You're not in the kitchen anymore. You're really kind of a true CEO now. And that's giving you time freedom to even dream bigger about, wow, how could I help entrepreneurs smash through their ceilings? Like, how could I speak to myself 17 years ago? How would I train myself? And so you even started to step into that coaching others and and talk us through that a little bit as you've been working with other people. You know, what are some of those common limiting beliefs that come up that that um, in the process of going from startup to, to scaling that you see uh, in, the, in, in this coaching process? So honestly, I think most of the time it has to do with timeframes. A lot of people are, they, they feel like they can do very little in the short term and they have these crazy goals for the long term. Sure. And so what I love to do is work in 90 day increments with people. Uh, so we always, we'll, we'll take that annual yeah, this is what I want to do this year. And we bring it back to 90 days. And by the time we really figure out what has to happen for those 90 days, they can do what they thought they were going to do in a year in usually the 90 days, maybe. And um, so it, a lot of times the time aspect of it is big. The other thing I think for for small business owners specifically, and my, my passion and my heart is a lot for the brick and mortar uh, businesses, just because Anytime you start getting into inventory and overhead and employees and those kind of things, your your challenges become really, really different than service industries. And so, um, honestly, a lot of times they get into something because they're so passionate about it. And what I wish somebody would have not held back my passion at all, like, let me go for it. Let me just get out there and figure it out. But I really wish I would have had someone along the way in that first year or two to explain to me what my ratio should look like. Like if, you know, if I have, so in our business, obviously our two highest categories are going to be our cost of goods. So all of our food and, you know, things, and then our employees, those are our two biggest expenses. Well, now I know what percentage of our business that should be, but then I didn't, I was just like, I need people, uh, sure. Higher, 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 higher. And then all of a sudden, 50 cents out of every dollar is going into staff and we don't have the money to buy the groceries. And, you know, so like those realistic things, I wish I would have known earlier. Um, The other thing, uh, quite honestly, is I wish I would have had, no, I can be a little stubborn, so I may not have listened to them. Caveat up front. But I wish I would have had someone to tell me that that you don't have to constantly expand because where we felt the pain along the way is every time we grew and we would grow so fast that it's like, okay, we're ready for the next expansion. And I wish that I would have sat in some of those uncomfortable growth periods a little bit longer uh, because I, and 
this falls solely on my shoulders. I stretched the company too thin on, on a couple of different occasions where we were trying to make jumps. And it was, it was uncomfortable. It was really uncomfortable where we were. Uh, but we needed to have either made a transition in between that or we needed to sit in that uncomfortable space a little bit longer and just know that people were going to be upset because every seat in the restaurant was full all the time and they stopped coming because there was nowhere to sit. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, no, they stopped coming. We have to have more places to sit. We need a bigger place, you know. And so some of those kind of things, I wish I had had someone with me at that point that could have said, let me lay out for you how this could go bad. How did you go forward? Uh, because it did go bad. And then we had to come, you know, bring it back before we could go forward again. So those are those are some of the things that that I dealt with. And I'm very candid about the mistakes that we made along the way. Um, but uh, that I see similar paths with a lot of the businesses that I've coached uh, and or a lot of the the challenges come around staffing. Usually that's a big, big. Staffing and growth are the two things where people can really trip themselves up. Mm, yeah. You have such a unique perspective in like living it out and growing your team and now being in this visionary seat of this incredible, you know, company and now helping others like start. You said take a signature just and turn it into a six figure side hustle. And um, that's what you're helping businesses do now, which I think is absolutely incredible. Meredith, I would love to know, because we have lots of moms listening, and I love hearing these hacks and tricks and what worked for you that maybe it can work for me. So I'd love to just know from you, are there anything with having that much, like being in the food industry for so long, do you have any like tips for moms of any ages as far as like being in the kitchen, wanting to cook healthy, um, home cooked meals? Like, do you have any tips of like, this is what I do in specific meal prepping or, or anything that has worked for you that you could pass on to our audience? Yeah. So a lot of the dishes that we started with, with the company when I was making food at, out of the house initially was the things that I made for dinner for my own family. And so one of the things that I did constantly when my kids were young is I found every way possible to pack vegetables into dishes that they could not see or they could not feel a different texture of some place. Yeah. <laughs> so I make a lot of soups and casseroles and, you know, different things like that. And every filling of everything I make has vegetables in it. Nice. And, um, and you know, even down to things like taking a typical spaghetti sauce. Uh -huh. And instead of just using a, a straight, you know, sauce before I put it over the pasta, I add a bunch of spinach and I add bell peppers and I add zucchini and I add all of these fresh vegetables to a tomato sauce. Uh, as long as there's enough red, the kids have no clue that any of that is in there. Yes. Yeah. And they're getting all of these extra items. And what kid doesn't love spaghetti, right? So they're good with that. Um, yeah. The other thing that, that I did a lot uh, when my kids were young and a lot of our, the recipes that I had for them at that point in time came from a place of when my husband got into the army, it was our first very expensive business lesson. And we were broke. Like I had $50 a week to feed a family of four. So it came a little bit out of inspiration of figuring out, okay, how you're not going to buy a lot of meat because that's the most expensive thing. So how do I make these things stretch? And so I would go buy, I would wait until the turkeys were on sale for like 29 cents a pound. And I would go buy the whole turkey and I would roast it. And the first night we would have half of the turkey breasts and then we would take, I would take all the dark meat and make a casserole with that. And frozen peas and corn were really cheap. So they were always in the casserole. And then I would take the other half of the turkey breast and we would use that to make like a turkey salad for sandwiches. And then I would keep the carcass and I would cook that down to make broth. So I would have broth for other soups that we would make. I mean, you just, when you have to, you can get really, really resourceful. Um, and what I found is I would look for ways that I could pack things full of nutrition. So, you know, if you're trying to get protein and fiber for your kids, beans are a really good and expensive way to do that. Um, and, you know, just utilize as many components of something as you can. And uh, and I found with with soups, with sauces and with casseroles, I could get my kids to eat all kinds of things that if I put it on a plate on its own, there was going to be a fight at the dinner table, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of what we did when they were little is just really find ways to, 
to mix all of the flavors together and they love it. Steve and I are laughing about the spaghetti yeah. sauce because just last night we made um, like a spaghetti pasta, pasta like, for dang, Kaizen. Like, dang, I should have mixed some stuff in there. Yeah, and it was like a pretty good sauce, you know, but I'm like, oh, I could have added more. So I'm going to try yeah. and be like sneaky because right now our three-year-old, some things are touch and go as far as what, yeah. what he will eat. He'll be really like. into broccoli one day and then not into it at all yeah, for a week so. or two. So <laughs> that's a really great tip. I love that. Yep, I totally do. I love the stewardship too. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about that a lot in Remakers is like, you know, making a lot out of a little and even just down to a turkey carcass, you know, like where some people are just like, oh, I just do this and I throw it away, you know, but you really stretch that thing. That's a, that's a mindset. That's a skill set that you can use in your business and your life. Mm -hmm. It's just like, how can I take a little and make it into a lot? I want to talk a little bit about that because you have a thing called turn a signature disc into a six figure side hustle. This is like your new avenue of coaching that, that you're, releasing but i just think you know we may have some people listening to this show who are like i love to cook i've been cooking for other people mm -hmm. i've been doing meal you know and they might be interested in this so talk about that a little bit turning a signature dish into a six-figure side hustle yeah so basically what we're looking at is it i'm taking people through the process that i went through 17 years ago which is to take something that you do and do it really well and then take that avenue to get something started right and I think so many people look at starting a business as I've got to get my business cards and my website and I've got to, you know, do all this networking and then I've got to go do this. And, and sometimes it's like, no, you, you've got to have something that's really good and then you just need to go sell one or you just need to go get one customer and have a proof of concept, right? Because the, the confidence that comes with that is what will lend to you continuing to build. And um, I, so... I'm a product of building businesses offline. Like this whole being online, even with you guys in, in this space is a new way for me to build a business because everything I've done with all of my other companies has been totally organic offline traffic. Uh, but I still feel like that is the most powerful way to build a small business. And so what we're going through in this challenge is how to identify the signature dish, how to build a story that builds a company, uh, how to know your costs so that you're not spending too much on your groceries, how to do things like, you know, if I have to go buy this meat and I only need it for this dish, what else can I do with this to make sure that it so that I can spread it to other things and I can make additional money on it or I can use it in different dishes um, and down to coming up with ideas for how to sample products to people uh, and really how to build it. So we're going to be building that out. I'm actually doing a five-day challenge on that where we're going to build it out over the course of the five days. And it's what I wish somebody, if if somebody could have come along 17 years ago and said, do this, do this, do this in this order, that's exactly that's exactly what we're going to do. And so some of these things I did really, really well then. And some of them I can look back now and say, well, if I would have tweaked this just a little bit, it would have worked a lot better. And so now we get to come along and do that. And honestly, I get so much more excited about helping other people with their stuff than I do with my own. So like, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, you know, getting people going with that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll definitely get links from you, put them in the show notes for anyone interested. But I think, I mean, it's such a cool idea. I mean, especially, I mean, I know you, you really specialize in the offline and there's so much, you know, to like, especially um, if you live in a larger city, like there's so much you can do there. But even like, I feel like the internet has opened up so many opportunities for food, like based businesses, mm -hmm. where even just like, there's some businesses that are built on one product, one mm -hmm. thing, like, you know, nothing bunt cakes, right? It's like, they just do cakes, you know, and it's like the same cake, different flavors, or, or like mochi nuts, or like, there's like these signature dishes that someone came up with, mm -hmm. and they made a whole thing on it. Yep. I, we have a... That's all we do. <laughs> so, yeah. Are you, what, you said it was cookies? No, beef jerky. Oh, beef jerky. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's another company. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And like we've been well, lately, we've been using Gold Belly um, for like gifting stuff to people. And it's so fun to see like these stories of, I mean, some of these are big brands, but some of them are just like, you know, this is this random person who's, you know, created this brand around this one product. And I don't know, it's just a fun, exciting, you take on e-commerce, like we really do a lot of e-commerce, but we're typically selling, you know, physical mm -hmm. products. I like the consumables industry though, because like people eat it and they want more of it. Mm -hmm. So you can sell it to the same person over and over and over again, which is awesome. So yeah, if you're interested in that, you're listening to this, definitely check out the show notes. We'll put some links 
Uh, Meredith, like where could people find you online if they, if they want to dig into more of your stuff? Of course, I'll put a link to the, we'll put a link to the challenge, but do you have a site or anywhere you want to send people? Um, so right now, the easiest place to find me is on social media. Uh, we actually are just starting a brand new uh, YouTube channel called Make Money Cooking. <laughs> and so uh, there's going to be lots of episodes going up there. And that'll, a lot of it will have to do with obviously food, but there's going to be a lot of it that has to do with just general business and starting business as well. Uh, otherwise, on on social, you can follow me on Mission Main Street on uh, on Facebook and Instagram. Awesome. awesome. Make money cooking. I love the YouTube. That's yeah. awesome. Perfect. We'll definitely subscribe. Well, thank you, Meredith, for being on, sharing your wisdom today with our crew. And uh, until the next episode, we'll see you soon. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Rainmaker Family Show. Hey, if you are not a part of our Rainmaker Mastermind, we have a new opportunity for you to book a one-on-one -on -one strategy call with one of our Rainmaker coaches. If you want to get a call with them, see if it's a good fit for you to work with us to build a business that allows you to have time freedom and financial freedom. You can get that call at makeitrainmama.com slash podcast. That's makeitrainmama, M-O-M-M-A dot com slash podcast.